Psychopathology is a bit of a weird word. When we break it down, psycho means the mind and pathology is the study of disease. So of course in this psychopathology video series, we're going to be looking at a range of mental health conditions. And these are OCD, depression and phobias. For each of these psychopathologies, we'll consider their explanation and treatment using a different psychological approach. The behaviorist approach applied to phobias, the cognitive approach applied to depression, and the biological approach applied to OCD. But before we start with that, we need to consider how to actually define someone as mentally abnormal. And it turns out not to be as easy to come up with a clear definition for abnormality as you might think. This is a definition that includes everyone we'd like to support while not including people we wouldn't want to define as mentally abnormal. So in this definition of abnormality video, we're gonna look at four competing definitions of abnormality and the strengths and weaknesses of each. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos and the Discord channel. Statistical infrequency. Our first definition, statistical infrequency, is likely the most obvious. Someone is mentally abnormal if their mental condition is very rare in the population. How common or rare behaviour is can be judged objectively using statistics. For example, we can use a normal distribution curve to show the average spread of a certain characteristic across a population. Most people will be around the middle, but as we move away from the centre, fewer and fewer people will have those values. If we want to compare an individual's behaviour to the rest of the population, we can use this data to identify those individuals who are most unusual. One characteristic of interest to psychologists is intelligence. If we measure intelligence according to IQ, the average IQ is 100 and it's at the highest point of this graph. We can argue someone is two standard deviations away from the average is abnormal. In this low intelligence bracket, we would include just over 2% of the population. We could argue this is an objective way of measuring who falls into the category of low intelligence, and importantly, who is in most need of support. We can phrase this as a positive evaluation. We can say that those people who fall into the bottom end of the curve have been objectively measured to have low IQ. The judgment of who receives support and who doesn't isn't dependent on the potentially subjective opinion of a clinician. However, we can criticize statistical infrequency by pointing out the place the psychological community says low intelligence ends and normal intelligence starts is a subjective decision and will affect a large number of people. It could be that someone has an IQ score just one IQ point higher than the cutoff and is denied treatment. Deciding where to split low and normal IQ has real world implications on those people it affects. Also, not all statistically infrequent traits are negative. For example, this definition includes those people with low intelligence but also people at the higher end of intelligence. This is just as statistically rare, but of course we wouldn't want to define someone with high intelligence as having a psychopathology and in need of additional support. Another valid criticism of statistical infrequency is that some psychopathologies are quite common. Two examples of common mental health conditions are depression and anxiety. In a survey by the NHS, about one in six adults, so 17% of those people surveyed, met the criteria for a common mental health disorder. So this definition of statistical infrequency doesn't match the high incidence of mental health disorders in society. Failure to function adequately. The previous definition compares an individual against the wider population. This definition, failure to function adequately, considers the individual's ability to cope in their daily lives, including their ability to interact with the world around them and meet the challenges they encounter. Some individuals may struggle to meet those requirements. Rosenhan and Seligman have outlined several features of failure to function. These are Maladaptive behaviour is where an individual behaves in ways that goes against their long-term interests. This could include self-harm or unhealthy patterns of eating or interacting with others in ways that damage relationships. For example, if you work in a shop, it might be in your best interest to be nice to customers. You know that your long-term best interests, like keeping your job, are best served by not being hostile, sarcastic, or aggressive towards customers. Personal anguish. So this is where we can see the individual is suffering from anxiety and distress as a result of their inability to cope with day-to-day -day life. They may want to interact with the world, but struggle to even get out of bed and ready. Observer discomfort is where an individual's behavior causes distress to those around them. Examples of this include poor personal hygiene and not respecting other people's personal space. 
Irrationality is where we find it difficult to understand the motivation behind someone's behaviour, and this is linked to unpredictability and unexpected behaviour. These issues can give the impression that these individuals cannot fully control their behaviour. Unconventionality is when someone's behaviour goes against what is typically expected in society. This could include inappropriate behaviour at work, an unusual sense of dress, or behaviour that simply doesn't match what we'd expect from a person in a given situation. One criticism of the failure to function definition of abnormality is that the decision about whether someone's coping or not is subjective and based on the opinion of observers. This means that two observers might not agree on whether someone's coping or not. Another issue is that the definition only includes people who are unable to cope, which excludes some people who would be considered abnormal, such as psychopaths. Psychopaths are often able to function in society in ways that make them successful, such as lower empathy, which can make it easier to make decisions that are helpful in business and politics. However, while they feel no distress themselves, psychopathy often has negative implications for the people around them. Another criticism is that not all maladaptive behaviour is an indication of mental illness. Taking part in extreme sports or smoking and drinking alcohol all risks the individual's health, so arguably maladaptive. But we wouldn't want to diagnose these people with a mental illness. One positive aspect of the failure to function definition of abnormality is that it respects the individual and their own experience which is something that other definitions, such as statistical infrequency and deviation from social norms, cannot do. Deviation from social norms A social norm is an unwritten expectation of behaviour that can vary from culture to culture and change over time. Even what is acceptable in one context might not be acceptable in another, and people who deviate from these expectations may be seen as abnormal or social deviants. For example, the differences in social norms between the context of a nightclub and a classroom if someone were to use the social norms of a nightclub in a classroom, they would quickly be seen as abnormal. One important point to consider when discussing deviation from social norms is that these norms are dictated by an individual's culture. One might be considered acceptable in one culture, might not be seen as acceptable in another. Examples of this can vary greatly between cultures, such as the acceptance of homosexuality, face and hair covering, acceptable food and how to eat it, the level of modesty in clothing choices and public displays of emotion. When evaluating deviation from social norms, one positive aspect might be that it respects cultural differences between societies. It does not impose a set definition of abnormality that could, for example, impose a Western view of abnormality or an Eastern culture. Therefore, it could be said that deviation from social norms is not ethnocentric. One issue of using deviation from social norms as a definition of abnormality is it can be difficult to apply when people from one culture move to a different culture with different norms. For example, people from an Afro-Caribbean background living in the UK are seven times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than people living in the UK, or people from Afro-Caribbean nations living in Afro-Caribbean nations. This is due to something called category failure, where a Western definition of mental illness is applied to individuals who are not acting according to Western cultural norms. In Afro-Caribbean cultures, hallucinations and conversations with angels may be considered part of a normal religious experience so a doctor in the West Indies would be less likely to diagnose schizophrenia based on these symptoms. However, in the UK, they may be more likely to do so. Another criticism of this definition of abnormality is it can be seen as punishing people who are trying to express their individuality or repressing people who do not conform to cultural norms. Deviation from ideal mental health Marie Jehoda's deviation from ideal mental health definition comes from a humanistic perspective. This means it doesn't focus on dysfunction or deficit, but instead on ways to improve and become a bad person. Jehoda identifies six features of ideal mental health. According to Jehoda, deviation from these features may indicate abnormality. Environmental mastery refers to the ability to adapt and thrive in new situations. Autonomy is the ability to act independently and trust in one's abilities. Resistance to stress refers to the internal strength to cope with the anxiety caused by daily life. Self-actualization is the ability to reach one's potential through personal growth. A positive attitude towards oneself is characterized by high self-esteem and self-respect. Accurate perception of reality is the ability to see the world as it truly is, without being distorted by personal biases. One limitation of this definition comes from its basis in humanistic psychology, which may reflect a Western perspective on mental health. This can be seen as an example of an emic construct, where a perspective from one culture in this case an individualistic American culture, is incorrectly applied to all people as a universal construct. In many cultures, people may not place value on autonomy 
as it's not part of their cultural norms, and personal freedom is not seen as a necessary or positive aspect of life. Instead, in collectivist societies, many people value playing a role in supporting a family or group, not focusing on individual success. Another criticism of this definition is the strictness of the criteria for what defines mental health. It's very difficult for most people to achieve all of the criteria for ideal mental health at any one time, which means that this definition would define most people as abnormal, at least at some point in their lives. A positive evaluation of this definition is it's a positive and holistic approach to mental health that takes into account multiple factors in diagnosis and provides suggestions for personal development. This definition does not simply state what's wrong, but also provides hints about how to fix problems. Additionally, this definition respects the individual and their own experience, which is something that other definitions, such as statistical infrequency and deviation from social norms, don't. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Kat Posnick and Ahmed Romani for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the Psychopathology unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.